OA1 The Hits. Cheers. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, does weather affect the spread of the coronavirus outside a building in the open air? Not really, experts say. The World Health Organization says the virus can be spread in any kind of weather. There is also no reason to believe that cold weather can kill it. The WHO says the virus is mainly spread between people. Rain and snow may help reduce the amount of the virus on chairs or other outside objects. But spread of the virus from surfaces is not believed to be a major contributor to the COVID-19 health crisis. Scientists say the real concern about cold weather is that lower temperatures are more likely to keep people indoors. They also are more likely to be in more crowded spaces where the virus can spread more easily. Studies have shown that a large percentage of spread happens within homes when people are sharing common areas like bathrooms. The WHO and others have also warned about the virus spreading in indoor areas with poor ventilation. They note the virus can be spread in the air and infectious particles might remain in the air for several hours. Some infections have been linked to nightclub visits, working out at physical exercise centers, and even performing with other people as part of a singing group. The coronavirus does not spread as often outdoors because fresh air breaks up the virus particles. People also have an easier time keeping their distance from others in outdoor areas. But experts warn that coronavirus spread is still possible if people spend extended periods of time outdoors close to others without covering their nose and mouth. Health officials say the best way to stop spread of the virus is to wear a face mask in public, stay at least two meters away from people not in your home, and repeatedly wash your hands. The United Nations Weather Agency says a continuing weather event places some countries at risk of weather-related problems. The World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, predicts La Nina will continue to affect the world's weather through January. The weather event is expected to bring drier and wetter conditions than normal to different parts of the world. La Nina is a weather pattern that happens in the Pacific Ocean but affects weather around the world. A La Nina event happens 
when ocean surface waters cool along the Pacific coast of the South American tropics. This takes place about every two to seven years. The latest predictions show La Nina will cause drier than normal conditions in much of East Africa and lead to more rainfall in Southern Africa. Central Asia is likely to see below normal rainfall earlier than usual. The WMO reports some of the Pacific Islands and the northern part of South America will see unusual changes in wet weather. These changes in weather patterns can put countries in some parts of the world at greater risk. Gavin Eiley is a humanitarian expert for the WMO. He told VOA parts of Eastern Africa were of special concern. The area is already suffering such problems as locust insects eating crops. Weather imaging suggests below normal rainfall for a large part of eastern Africa, Eiley explained. So that could have a number of effects on places like Somalia. The WMO said governments can use weather predictions to plan ways to reduce harmful effects on agriculture, health, water resources, and disaster supervision. All of these are sensitive to a changing climate. Max Dilley is a director of climate services at the WMO. He said governments can use predictions of La Nina to adapt their action plans. You can imagine in the agricultural sector that some crops will do well under wet conditions and others will do better under dry conditions, Dilly said. And there are agricultural supervision methods that can be changed based on whether dry or wet weather is expected. Dilly said the WMO is trying harder to make its predictions with attention to specific concerns. These include issues like food security or human health. Dilly gave one example related to health and disease. He said wet conditions alone do not lead to more cases of dengue fever or malaria. Dilly explained that temperature, wet air, and vegetation create the conditions for mosquito populations to rise. So, rather than just giving a rainfall prediction, he said, meteorologists will provide disease predictions. The goal is to use the predictions to control dengue fever or malaria. I'm Alice Bryant. Denmark says it plans to destroy its whole population of minks after the animals apparently spread the new coronavirus to humans. Prime Minister Meta Fredriksson said government investigators had discovered a mutation in the virus in 12 people in northern Denmark. The individuals are believed to have been infected by minks. Denmark's health minister said that half of nearly 800 human COVID-19 cases in northern Denmark are related to minks. Denmark is the world's main exporter of mink fur. 
most of the fur is sent to China and Hong Kong. Fredrickson called the situation very serious and warned that the mutation could make future coronavirus vaccines ineffective. Health officials said they found virus versions in humans and minks that showed decreased sensitivity to antibodies. They said this could make future vaccines less effective. Fredrickson told reporters the mutated virus in minks could have harmful effects worldwide. We have a great responsibility towards our own population, but with the mutation that has now been found, we have an even greater responsibility for the rest of the world as well," she said. To deal with the problem, the government said it was necessary to cull the country's total population of fifteen. To seventeen million minks. Officials said police and military forces would be deployed to speed up the process. The discovery of the mutation was shared with the World Health Organization and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. The head of the WHO's emergencies program. Mike Ryan called for scientific investigations into how the coronavirus is being spread between minks and humans. We have been informed by Denmark of a number of persons infected with coronavirus from mink, with some genetic changes in the virus, the WHO said in a statement to Reuters. The WHO also provided a statement to the French press agency AFP. In a few instances, the minks that were infected by humans have transmitted the virus to other people. These are the first reported cases of animal-to-human transmission, the statement said. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that are common in people and many different species of animals, including camels, cattle, cats, and bats. The CDC adds that animal coronaviruses rarely infect people. And then spread between people. However, the organization said this happened with the new coronavirus, which causes the disease COVID-19. Scientists have said the new coronavirus likely started in bats and began spreading to humans at a market in China. Danish officials say a total. Of 207 of the country's fur farms had been infected with COVID-19. Denmark already started culling millions of mink last month in northern areas. The government has promised to compensate farmers for the losses. There are more than 1,000 such farms in the country. The Animal Cause Group, Humane Society International, praised the Prime Minister for taking a necessary and science-based step to protect Danish citizens. It said that such a large cull represents an animal welfare tragedy. However, the group said it hoped that losing so many mink to the coronavirus. Will persuade fur farms to get out of the business. Danish officials said 
increased restrictions and stronger contact tracing efforts will be ordered in parts of the North to help contain the virus. Kara Molbach is the director at Denmark's State Serum Institute, the health body that deals with infectious diseases. The worst-case scenario is a new pandemic, starting all over again out of Denmark, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The American Civil War in the 1860s was fought not only on land. There was a great deal of fighting between the Union and Confederate navies. This part of the war, the Sea War, is often forgotten, but it was important. The Union victory might not have been possible without the successes of its navy. Many battles took place just off the coast of the United States. Many others took place farther away in international waters. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe talk about the naval side of the Civil War. As soon as the war started, President Abraham Lincoln wanted to block the South's major ports. He wanted to prevent the South from shipping its agricultural products to other countries in exchange for industrial goods. Lincoln's plan was good, but it had one major weakness. The Union Navy was too small for the job. The Confederate seacoast was long. It extended from Chesapeake Bay to Mexico, a distance of 5,600 kilometers. There were not enough ships in the Union Navy to blockade all of it. Many months would pass before the Union could build up an effective naval force. The Confederacy had no navy at the start of the Civil War. The Confederate government had little money to create one, and the South had no factories to build one. For a while, the Confederacy was able to get warships from Britain. Then the Union put diplomatic pressure on Britain to stop this support. For the most part, the Confederacy depended on privately owned ships to get goods in and out of the South. About twenty of these private ships flew the Confederate flag. Most were very successful in the beginning. The Florida, for example, captured more than thirty ships before being captured itself off the coast of Brazil in 1864. The Alabama captured more than 60 ships. 
It was finally sunk in a battle with the Kearsarge off the coast of France. The Shenandoah sailed in the Pacific Ocean. It captured 40 ships. After the war ended, the Shenandoah tied up in Liverpool, England. In addition to these victories, the Confederacy claimed responsibility for several new naval technologies during the Civil War. One was the first modern submarine. This ship was ten meters long. It sank four times while being tested. It was raised each time and put back into service. One night, it fired its torpedoes at a much larger Union ship and sank it. But the explosion was so great that it tore apart the submarine, and it sank too. The Confederacy also developed very effective underwater explosive devices for use in the harbors. Even with its victories and technologies, however, the Confederacy could not stop the Union Navy. The Union Navy was bigger to begin with and grew much faster. During the first two years of the Civil War, the Union captured several southern ports, Fort Hatteras and Roanoke Island, North Carolina, Port Royal, South Carolina, Pensacola, Florida, and perhaps most importantly, New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans lay near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It was the largest city in the South. It was the largest seaport. It had become a busy industrial center, producing war equipment for Confederate forces. If the Union could capture New Orleans, it would control the Mississippi River. President Lincoln appointed Navy officer David Farragut to lead the attack on New Orleans. To reach the city, Farragut had to sail his ships past two Confederate forts on the Mississippi River. He shelled the forts for six days and nights, but the forts were so strong that the shells caused little damage. He decided not to wait any longer. One dark night, Farragut led 17 Union warships up the river in a line. The Confederate forces heard them and began to fire. One ship was sunk. Three others were damaged so badly that they could not continue. But 13 made it safely past the forts. When Farragut reached New Orleans, he found the city defenseless. Several thousand Confederate soldiers had fled. They knew they could not defend against the bigger Union force. Only civilians remained. Farragut captured New Orleans without a fight. The Confederate flag was lowered, and the United States flag was raised over the city. Several weeks before Farragut captured New Orleans, a new kind of Navy battle was fought off Hampton Roads, Virginia. It was the first battle between iron ships. On the Confederate side was the Virginia. It had been built from what remained of a captured Union warship called the Merrimack. The Virginia was like no other warship ever seen in the world. It was 80 meters long. The part that showed above the water line was built of wood 60 centimeters thick. This part was covered with sheets of iron 10 centimeters thick. Ten windows were cut into it. Behind each window was a cannon. In a battle, the windows would open, the cannons would fire, and the windows would close again. 
At the front was a sharp point of iron that could smash through the sides of wooden ships. The Virginia could not move fast, and it was difficult to control. It took almost thirty minutes to turn around. Still, there seemed to be no way to stop this iron monster. It already had destroyed two Union warships, and it was coming back for more. The Union ship chosen to fight the Virginia was the Monitor. It, too, was covered with iron, but it was much smaller than the Virginia, and it carried only two cannons. These two cannons, however, were on a part of the ship that could turn in a complete circle. They could be aimed in any direction. The Monitor and the Virginia faced each other on the morning of March 9th, 1862. They moved in close, very close, then began to fire. A Confederate cannonball hit the iron side of the Monitor and bounced away. Union sailors cheered. The cannons of the Virginia could do no damage. But the Union sailors soon discovered that their cannons could do no damage either. The men inside the two ships suffered from noise, heat, and smoke. The roar of their own cannons was extremely loud. Even louder was the crash of enemy cannonballs and explosive shells on the iron walls. Some of the men suffered burst eardrums. At least one man was struck unconscious from the force of a cannonball against the iron. The men quickly learned to stay away from the walls. Smoke from the cannons filled the ships. Then it floated out over the water. At times, the two ships could not see each other. The Virginia and the Monitor fought for three hours. Neither ship scored an important hit. Neither suffered serious damage. Then the cannons of the Virginia fell silent. The Confederate ship had used up its gunpowder. It also had used up much of its fuel. It was lighter now and was floating higher in the water. A well-aimed cannonball could hit below its iron covering and sink it. The Confederate captain decided to withdraw. The Union captain, too, was ready to break off the battle. He decided not to follow. Neither ship could claim victory. But the Monitor had kept the Virginia from destroying more of the Union's wooden warships. The Virginia itself was to live just two more months. Union forces seized the Confederate Navy base at Norfolk, where the Virginia was kept. And the Iron Monster was sunk to keep it from falling into Union hands. The battle at Hampton Roads between the Virginia and the Monitor was undecisive. It did not have much effect on the final result of America's Civil War. But it was still an important battle, for it marked the beginning of the end of the world's wooden navies. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 